Okay, we have time for some questions. Prince over there has a microphone and Seth has a microphone, so. I was quite sorry. Uh, was there an opportunity in this very short period from February to through May, I guess, for Greece to do what Argentina did, you know, not pay the IMF uh, that five, that three point five billion dollars and say we're going to default, get a, get me out of there. And the other thing I wanted to ask you was the moral uh, duty that Germany had by taking a loan from Germany uh, from Greece at the end of World War II and never repaying. Yeah, uh, okay, both, both interesting questions. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things the creditors extracted from Greece right at the start as a condition of not pushing them to the wall in February was uh, a, that the Greek government would honor all of its obligations. So they, they anticipated the move that you're describing. Uh, they, uh, and had Greece not, I, I would have objected to that phrase. I saw it on, in the documents and thought this is going to be trouble. Uh, but uh, had Greece not uh, agreed to that, the terms of the uh, financial arrangement would have expired at the end of February. Uh, and at that point, the government was barely in place uh, and would not have been equipped to deal with the, uh, with, 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 with the consequences. So they were in a bind from the beginning. They had to uh, extend the process through to the end of June. I'm with you, however, if it had been my play, I would have strongly considered uh, cutting it off in April. Uh, when you had enough time to figure out something about how you were going to handle the consequences, but you still had some reserves in the bank. When we, and we knew this. We knew that if we got to the end of June, we'd be out of money, uh, that we'd be out of the program, and that we, well, we thought uh, that we'd be, be, we, we would have lost the support of the public. That was wrong. The Greek government didn't lose, never lost the support of the public, which was astonishing, but there, there it was. Uh, we, but we knew that this was going to that playing this out to the end of June, we were going to be in a very weak position, uh, and that is why the strategy was to go to the political level and see if you could turn turn things on some higher ground. Uh, I think the lesson learned is clear, uh, and it's very much in the line of your question. A successor government should not allow itself to run out of. Another government in this position should never allow itself to be drained of reserves, right? and should have its uh, its plan B on the table. You know, instead of having an obscure, well, a non-obscure academic working obscurely on it at his kitchen table in Austin, there should be someone at the, in, in the office next to the finance minister. Office of Plan B should be right there, with a little glass brass plaque on the door, uh, so that you. Uh, People know that you're, you're, you're prepared. Uh, I think that will be clear. It will be very difficult for any further government in a similar situation not to do that. So that's, things did change as a result of what we did. On the second question, um, it's absolutely clear. Greece was forced, I think it was in 42, uh, it was, it was, it was a, uh, a loan to support uh, the Africa Corps, the Super Rommel in, in North Africa. Uh, was, was forced to make a loan to the Germans. Uh, the, the, the Germans did not take that loan with them. But when they left, it's framed on the wall of the Bank of Greece, the contract. It's still there. Uh, and it is, a, it is a problem for the Germans because that loan is a legal loan. I mean, it is a legally to be repaid loan. They are still obliged to it. And it's hard for Wolfgang Schäuble to explain why Greece must pay its, its, its unpayable debts, whereas Germany cannot be expected to repay a completely uh, uh, coerced loan that it took out under essentially criminal circumstances. Sir. So, um, this is Portugal. It's, it's not turned on. Oh, sorry, it was 
drop. So just examining the pig countries, so Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, they all faced an economic downturn during the 2008 um, economic crisis. But when you look at Portugal, Greece, and Spain specifically, if you do kind of a historical uh, case study, you see, you know, they went through their own democratic revolutions in 1974, 1975, mm -hmm. and yet they faced the same economic situation in the late 2000s. But yet when you examine Portugal and Spain, when you look at the differences in their approach, when you look at the economic outcomes, you see somewhat of a, at least an incremental economic recovery, yet whereas in Greece you still see this economic downturn still occurring. Do you think that there's something that Greece can emulate that Portugal and Spain, I guess, I would say, you know, they're doing correctly? Yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> what happened in Spain, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure, well, the Portuguese situation is contested, but what happened in Spain uh, is that it abandoned austerity about 16 months ago. Uh, at, because it's a right-wing government, uh, it can still claim that it's the, the growth of the Spanish economy is the result of austerity, and the Europeans are willing to <coughs> look the other way, turn a blind eye, and let them pursue a policy which is intended to keep the right-wing government in power in the elections that are about to happen. Uh, but Spain has been adding civil servants and increasing government spending for a considerable period of time. And that's the main reason why the Spanish government, ha the Spanish economy has, has, has improved, whereas the Greeks were not in a position to do that. Uh, Portugal, uh, and Spain are not under memoranda right now, so they are not having their policies dictated in fine detail by the creditors. Uh, and that also is, I think, a, uh, something which is, which is working to their advantage relative to Greece. So those are, those are two, the two significant differences. What's happening in Ireland, um, I was just there, uh, is uh, substantially that Ireland is very much tied into the British economy UK is having a big property boom. Ireland is benefiting from, from that and from the, its tax structures, which permit uh, actually quite, a, quite an interesting uh, approach to having uh, you know, the, some parts of the operations of Google and Apple and other tax avoiding US tech firms <laughs> in Dublin, where they have an English speaking professional base and very good access to all the rest of Europe. So, it's become strategically interesting to the operating environment. Um, so those are those are among the reasons why those countries have experienced right now is it's a little bit different than we Hi, uh, my question is, um, I don't know if it's off topic, but uh, recalling uh, Norway's debt default some years ago, do you think that there was an option for Greece? And my other question is- Sorry, whose debt default? Norway's. Is it Norway default on your debt? Uh, no, not Norway, surely. Norway swimming in the world. Iceland. I might not. Iceland. 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 I'm sorry. Iceland. 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 Yes. Yeah. Iceland. What, what do you um, do? You think um, Greece ever could have took that option to default? And the other question is, uh, what uh, what are the benefits that Greece even has staying in the EU? What are the benefits of <laughs> that Greece has staying in the EU? In the Europe. Okay. Um, the Icelandic. Uh, uh, experience was well known uh, in Athens. We had people working with us who were intimately familiar with it. Uh, Iceland is not a member of the EU. It has its own currency. Uh, and its, uh, uh, its obligations were not obligations of the Icelandic government. What, I, what Iceland did was to refuse to accept liability for bank uh, deposits that had were made in Icelandic banks fraudulently um, uh, to British and Dutch uh, depositors. Um, and so it, it cut those off uh, and um, depreciated and recovered quite quickly. Um, the problem for Greece is that to move, that was clearly a, a practically the ideal thing to do. I mean, the Iceland, uh, uh, Iceland uh, could have just been reduced to nothing, only 300,000 people. Uh, I mean, that's a suburb of Houston, that's small. <laughs> um, but it didn't. It, 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 it was able to, to, to uh, 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 maneuver through this very effectively. Uh, for Greece, the problem was that to get out of the euro and be in a position to default on the value, 
you had to go through a transition period. And the mechanics of the transition period were not at all obvious to the Greek finance ministry or the Greek government. First of all, where do you get cash? It's a country of 11 million people. Somebody's got to come up with paper. You know, printing presses were not there. Not so, and creating an alternative currency, well, means you have to, some has got to get it out into, you've got to reprogram the ATM so that people have access to it. These are things which take time, and the problem is that pensioners in Greece, this is the thing that worried me, or that came to me as the most sort of difficult issue, pensioners in Greece draw their pensions by going to the ATMs. So if the ATMs are dry, you're talking about elderly people who may not be able to eat. And that is not an acceptable idea. So working the, the, the logistics, working how the transformation of bank accounts, uh, making sure there's enough oil, enough food, enough medicine, if the hospitals have insulin and other things that are required to keep people alive. These were kinds of questions that the government would have had to face, did face actually to a certain degree, and did some looking into in the uh, in the in June, uh, but uh, daunting, uh, and you know it's much more daunting actually for a country of 11 million, including a lot of elderly people, than for a country of 300,000 on a nice compact island. Right? So that's the kind of kind of situation we're facing. Would Greece be better off out of the euro? Yes and no. Out of the euro, it, in the euro, Greek banks create euro. So the purchasing power available to a Greek borrower is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tied to the euro itself. And that's a great advantage. Uh, on the other hand, out of the euro, if the drachma depreciated by a reasonable but not excessive amount, there would be a substantial gains of competitiveness and a lot of money would come in, come back in, which is which has fled. So there were there my feeling is that on balance, a well managed uh, separate currency is probably a better thing to do. But could we guarantee that the transition would lead to a well managed state within three, six months? No, we couldn't guarantee that. And Alexis said this in Parliament, he said you were out of, out of reserves. Does anybody think that it's going to come and help us support the value of our currency? No. I raised this. I actually had this conversation with staff at the Federal Reserve. So they knew what would have to happen for Greece not to collapse. But could I have told the Greek government that the United States was going to come in and with a swap line to protect our NATO ally? No, I couldn't have told them. I couldn't have guaranteed that. I couldn't even have suspected. I didn't have any, any they, they were not in a position to give me any feedback. So I would have had to say, you know, Prime Minister, you have to assume that you're on the line. And he would have said, thanks very much. I think we better stick with the, with the devil we got. <laughs> so we have time for one last question. I'm there. Okay. Um, when you were in Greece, um, Golden Dawn, I think, is has gotten a third number of seats in the last two elections. What did you personally witness of a, of a genuine fascist movement? Secondly, one of the shocking things was the complete collapse of PASO, and do you think that was largely deserved? Uh, Golden Dawn uh, had, was, was substantially, uh, the threat was essentially under control by the time Syriza came into power, when Syriza came into power. The overwhelming support of the Greek people gave, that Greek people gave to Alexis, 80% in But everybody who voted for them and half the people who didn't vote for them uh, was, uh, you know, essentially pushed the, the, the far right to the margins. Uh, and of course, the leaders of Golden Dawn were actually in jail and, and on trial, but they still leave them. Um, the, uh, what, what one witnessed earlier uh, was uh, it was scary. People were getting, Giannis was getting threats, but in particular, in 2013, um, at the conference in Austin, Alexis and his team, Nikos Papas and George Tadakos, 
uh, were, this was when uh, uh, there was a murder right outside of the uh, uh, Golden Dawn headquarters, uh, at, uh, at, which was captured on video. Uh, and you could see that if, you know, this was very clearly on people's minds. They were watching that tape, assessing what was uh, the psychological effect of having street gangs, basically, or hit teams, uh, that were uh, turning ordinary politics into a, uh, into a, a was essentially a gang. Uh, so there was that, um, as I say. Uh, it, was, it was something which, in 2013, you didn't know which way it was going to go. Uh, but through 2014, it, the pre public just came and consolidated themselves around, uh, around Syriza instead, which is me. Represented the, the, the kind of uh, one of the one of the most uh, exciting political movements I've ever witnessed. I was in Portugal, by the way, in 1975, 23 years old, uh, and that was the other moment uh, that I've seen. I wasn't in, I wasn't in Europe for the collapse of the rule of law, but these kind of moments don't come along. Thank you.